You know, so I'm so glad, you know, Chaplain Ham, Chaplain Jung, and our, uh, you know, scripture reading person, uh, you know, because we are almost the same height, right? Okay, yeah, so you know, that's why it doesn't move, right? You know, usually, you know, once, you know, tall guy come out, and then my turn, you know, my job is to, you know, put it down, and then, you know, make it, you know, my level or something like that. Okay, I'm Chaplain Hyo Seok Kim, uh, Second Combat Aviation Brigade Chaplain. The reason why I introduce myself, you know, keep introducing myself, you know, to the congregation is because we have uh, quite a few chaplains in the chapel. Amen? Yeah, when I was with, uh, you know, Camp Carroll Chapel Service, only two chaplains. So I don't need to keep introducing myself. So I am Chaplain Hyo Seok Kim. This morning, I want to talk about who cares for our lives and how we have to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit guides us and teaches us some lessons through my sermon this morning. From verse chapter 1 verse 27 to verse chapter 2 verse 11, Paul had been encouraging the Philippians to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. He has been teaching on unity, harmony, and humility. Based on that understanding, let's take a look at verse 213. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. The word work in verse 13 uses a Greek word energy. An English word energy is the word derived from this Greek word. Energy is the power to act. Therefore, in verse 13, it is God who works in you means that God is moving our lives with the will, purpose, and meaning of the Lord in us. He is living in our lives so that God can hold on to our lives and become what the Lord wants us to be. Then, how is God working in us? God takes care of us as parents raise their children. Is there any parent in the world who says to their children just like this, My dear, it was hard for your mom and dad to give birth to you. So now you have to live on your own in the world. Wow, you know, that's interesting, right? Maybe if someone is extremely poor and in a very difficult situation, this situation might happen. But for the majority of parents, I am pretty sure that they have a wish to provide maximum support for their children. For example, if my child has a musical talent, I will try to create an environment where he or she can study music as much as he or she wants and be able to thrive. Parents' feelings toward their children are that they want to tighten their belts when they are short of money and pay for lessons even if they work late at night especially parents whose children are musically, athletically, or artistically talented, often sacrificed a lot. A famous pro golfer, yeah, Korean pro golfer, by the way, Sari Pak's father took hands off from his business to make her his daughter a successful pro golfer and supported her with his best. Another well-known figure skater, 
you know, Olympic, Olympic gold medalist. Yuna Kim's mother invested almost all her time in her daughter giving up her life. In some ways, parents' dreams and lives are sometimes lost because of raising their children. Parents want to give everything to their children. As such, parents raise their children with a wish for their children to be successful. Our God also has a wish when He sees us and leads our lives. But God's way is quite different from that of the parents of this world. God knows so well that we cannot grow up if we are always in a peaceful and happy environment. So sometimes God takes us to the desert where we are likely to die. There, God reaches out His hands when, he beg when we begin to cling only to God, saying, God! Please save us. After giving up the logic, pride, and everything in the head. Through these experiences and hardships in the wilderness, we learn how great our Father God is and how much God loves us. Who would not be heartbroken to see their children suffer. But this is God's way of dealing with our lives. Let's take a look at verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. In other words, grumbling is complaining. At the root of the grumbling is distrust against God. If I grumble about God for the series of events and circumstances that take place in my life right now, it is a proof that I have distrust in God's sovereignty. When we go through hard and difficult situations, we should be able to trust God to the end and without blaming someone. Then God's wonderful peace and joy come into our lives. There are some people in the Bible who were good at grumbling. I believe everyone knows about this. It is the people of Israel. On their way to Canaan, the promised land, especially after the liberation of 400 years slavery from Egypt. They were constantly thanking. No, they were constantly grumbling. They were constantly complaining. Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 and 24 says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. So the people grumbled against Moses. What are we to drink? Interestingly, the fourth thing the people of Israel did after crossing the Red Sea was grumbling within three days. I want you to compare 400 years of slavery versus three days without water. It's a nonsense, right? Exodus chapter 16, verse 2 says, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Numbers 
chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. How sad it is. Their grumbling rolled into at first against Moses and Aaron, and finally, final destination is God right now. God heard about their complainings. They never stopped grumbling. What happened to the people of Israel who were so grumbling? God prevented them from entering the promised land. Probably the people of Israel thought they would enter the promised land of Canaan where milk and honey flow as soon as they got out of Egypt. But the desert, the land of death, was waiting for them between Egypt and Canaan. Our lives are similar. The land that the saved people should walk on is the wilderness of the world. The pain of God's training for us is to enter this desert. God knows well that we are not willing to kneel before God without hardship. It's so sad. So God made a people who had been saved walk in the desert to make them realize the Lord's holiness and fatherhood and to experience God's mercy and abundance through life. God plans for us to pass through the wilderness of life and grow mature. In verse 15, God's wonderful plan is written so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Hallelujah. The 15th verse explains in two ways that God intends to drive us into a wilderness-like path of life. The first reason is to make people of God blameless and pure. The term pure means the status that impure things are not mixed up with, which means that the word originally not mixed up with water. At the time of Paul's writing, the winemaking industry flourished. And the value of wine depends on its purity. The more water you mix up with wine, the less valuable it becomes. So the expression pure means that something is valuable without mixing at all. God leads us to be a pure people full of God alone without the dirty impurities of the word in us. The second reason God leads us to the desert is to show us as light to the world. We should understand the Apostle Paul's intention to use the word shine as lights in the world in verse 15 of the King James Version. Light is not necessary where there is a bright light. It's what you need in the dark. Why should we be made a child of light through training to extract impurities? Because the world is so dark. God trains us through hardship and makes us the children of the light who can move away from the darkness of the world. Iron becomes harder and stronger as it is hit by a blacksmith hammer. The harder the tree suffers from a storm, the stronger the tree becomes. A person who has experienced the pain can comfort a sick person. A person who has suffered from tough relationships 
can comfort a person who suffers from difficult relationships. God called us to go into the dark and shine as lights in the world. Let's take a look at verse 17 through 18. Paul expressed his life as a sacrifice to God, saying, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Amen. The offering does not exist for itself. It is a sacrifice that is worth being used for God and given to God. Paul emphasizes that we must live a life in which we sacrifice ourselves to God through spiritual maturity while we go on the path of life in the wilderness. At this point, I want to share one of my testimonies in my life. I have lived a life that I was not supposed to live. Before I was born, my family was heavily scammed, losing all our property and money, and falling into a very difficult environment. In this pair, as my mother was 45, and my father was 52 years old. She found out that she had been pregnant with me unexpectedly. Yeah, very important word, right? Unexpectedly for seven months. So she tried many ways to bless me. No, to abort me. But she failed. At the time, my father informed my eldest brother that if he would not take care of me, my father would somehow abort me. Then my eldest brother told my father not to worry because the youngest one to be born would be a great blessing for our family. That's how I was born in a poverty in a Buddhist family. Later in my childhood, I was almost adopted by American families through my parents three times due to poverty. But my big brother always turned it down at the last stage of the adoption process. Surprisingly, however, God called me at the age of 11 and made me his child. And, and three years later, my father met God during the fight against the liver cancer and experienced amazing healing and became God's child. And my mother put down everything she believed in Buddhism and superstition and became God's child. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> like this, God called it's one of my family members as his loving children, one by one. And above all, my eldest brother who worked hard to make me born has become a church elder. At the time, of course, I simply believed that believing in Jesus Christ would solve everything well and but the time of hardship in the wilderness continues. I had to go through many part-time jobs to pay for tuitions for my high school and college education and experienced the losses of two of my brothers in 1993 and 2003 due to an accident and an alcohol-related liver failure. I felt like it's the end of the world for a while, since I'm a normal human being too. In 1993, I was in Rock Army as a chaplain assistant, 
And I was totally shocked at the news of my second brother's sudden death. All these six months before he passed away, he received Jesus Christ. The question from inside came out, why? Very short time, at the age of 38, why God? To be worse, he left two boys behind, seven and five years old. Inside of my heart, I really, really worried about who would care for my nephews and just pray for their future. But it is God who has taken good care of them with grace and mercy. The first boy became an ordained pastor in 2015. And the second boy was ordained in 2019 to be a missionary for China. I was I, I, I stationed at Camp Kettle at the time. I took part in his uh, you know orda- ordained you know, ordaining ceremony, ordained ceremony. So it was you know it was the grace of God that took care of everything in in their lives. I just you know, praise the Lord. We are a lot of tears. In 2003, another brother's alcohol-related death made me feel very depressed. And it took a long time for me to recover, obviously. And I was wondering, what's the reason behind this tragic experience in my life? In 2018, I was assigned to a drug and alcohol leak cleaning as an instructor in Eisenhower Army Medical Center for Gordon, where God used my extensive understanding of drug and alcohol abuse when I led classes. Usually, I offer, you know, five sessions of the classes to the people. You know, on the first session, usually they take, take a look at me with a weird look. Hey, chaplain, I think you, you look young. And, you know, you are you know, probably holy person, you'd never experience this kind of stuff. You know, then I share, in the beginning of my class, I share my experience, how tough it was for me to bring my brother to the cleaning multiple times before I came over to the stay. And I cried with him. I felt the pain in the middle of his pain. Then they opened their hearts. Even God used my tragic experience for his kingdom. To be sure, those unwanted and unexpected experiences gave me a great deal of hardship and pain. But God convinced me that he was with me all the time. Amen? Amen. And I have become more resilient through those tough experiences. Now I deeply appreciate God for making me a pastor who can understand and embrace the pains of those in need. Only through the wilderness does one enter the promised land of Canaan. I am going to close my sermon. There are times when God allows us to be in the desert and the path of hardship to achieve spiritual maturity. Even in such cases, you must be able to trust God to the end. We must also pass through all the trainings in the wilderness that God has allowed. And we should live a life that we offer our entire life to God as a sacrifice. My dear brothers and sisters, let us confess with faith that our lives are in the Lord's wonderful plan. And may God bless you and me to be able to live the rest of our lives as holy living sacrifices to the Lord. Last question before I close my sermon. Who cares for your life right now? Who hold your future 
right now. It is Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior, who died and resurrected and will come again to see us and to give us eternity with Him forever. Let us pray. God, our strength and shield, you have power over every storm. We are on your throne and we rejoice in you. In the midst of so much uncertainty across our world, our faith in Christ anchors us. We will trust the one who died and defeated death by his resurrection. In dark times, we have a bright hope. Our future is secure in Christ who loves us. So, with thankfulness, we sing our songs of praise, declaring our joy and our hope found in Christ alone. In the name of the risen Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.